I was looking last night, I was telling somebody a while ago that we, I set up a, a YouTube channel years ago, and I haven't looked at it in years. It's one of them things, you know, and I'd put up some videos of the special singing in church and everything. And I know that back then everybody was tuned up a lot better because we practiced yeah. a lot. And life is busier and busier and busier. And so there's no time for that. It's hard to get. And so it cost us the all of the extra things in life. Is it ever going to slow down where we can enjoy life like we should? You reckon? When are we going to start throwing things out and canceling things to, and doing what really matters? Yeah. Oh my. John chapter 8. I'll just jump in here and try to get started because you know how it is. Try not to do too much other talking, but we're going to read this story. How many of you know what's in John chapter 8 before you look now? Now come on. You ought to be familiar with the Word of God until you know. You know, when I say John chapter 1, you ought to be able to tell me something out there. The Word. John chapter 2. A wedding. John chapter 3, Nicodemus. John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And on and on. See, you need to be familiar with the Word of God until you know it. You don't have to know everything that's in the chapter, but you ought to be able to recognize the woman caught in adultery. All right, let's read it first. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. Let me turn his light on. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Everything's going well so far. And the scribes and Pharisees showed up and brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What a rotten bunch of guys. Yes, sir. What a blind bunch of guys. They didn't even have a clue who they were talking to. Telling him what the law said. This they said, tempting him. There's their motive that they might have to accuse him. Their motive is not righteousness. Their motive is not purity. Their motive is not doing what is right. Their motive is to tempt the Lord and be able to accuse Him. These are evil men. Doesn't matter what kind of title they got after their name. It doesn't matter what school they went to. It doesn't matter what, uh, you know, what church they belong to or what their position in that church is. They're evil men. It's a shame because this woman had done terribly wrong. Yes, we're going to talk about that, but but they, they are the, they're the villains here. They're the villains of this story. But Jesus stooped down. You know, you never provoke Jesus. Jesus never fired back at you mm -hmm. with a comeback, a quick comeback to put you in your place. Very few words. I, I mark them in red when Jesus speaks and I'm looking at this, all this text here and here's a few and here's a few. That's all he said. He just stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Everybody think Jesus got a stick and wrote on the ground. He didn't get a stick and wrote on the ground. Wrote with his finger on the ground. <laughs> and that's a big deal. What did he write? Well, who knows? The Bible don't tell us that and we have no idea. So they know you speculating about that. This is such a deep well that there's plenty to think about without going off on tangents like that. He acted like he didn't even hear him. He may have been playing tic-tac-toe on the ground for all we know. He acted like he didn't even know him. Hear him. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, Come on, answer us. I mean, we want an answer here. Here's this woman. What are you going to do about her? He that is without sin among you, let him cast, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, the second time he stood up, saying, and saw none but the woman. He said unto her. Now, now for, don't forget. There's a big multitude. He's got a bunch of people. He was teaching. And these guys come in in the middle of this. They're not just this isolated thing happening out in the middle of a field somewhere. No. Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. Catch that. That's L-O-R-D, big letters, that is, that don't mean, like Abraham, Sarah called Abraham Lord, this is, she said Lord, Lord God Almighty. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Now I had no idea that this passage was so controversial. Until I began to study about it to, for this message here. I didn't know that there was this whole great crowd of people who have educated intellectual know-it-alls who thinks this passage don't belong in the Bible. They don't believe it should be there. Because of this and that and the other. But the main reason, you know, is because it looks like Jesus is soft on sin. Well, that puts them in the same class as these scribes and Pharisees yes. right there. That's who it is that don't want it in the Bible. Right. And let me tell you something. Any time that anything, anybody comes up with this idea of, well, now that shouldn't be in there. And it's the Word of God. I, I, I suspect them right away as being from the devil because that is who they usually are. I am very glad this is in the Bible. This is Jesus. This is how He is. In every situation. It's how he is, not how he was. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This same Jesus. <laughs> that's coming back for us, that went away, and he's coming back for this same Jesus, the same one there that day is the one that's here today. He deals with people exactly the same way. The main problem they all seem to have is that Jesus was soft on sin and appeared to be permissive toward adultery. This is the take that a lot of people have on it. I'm amazed in my small understanding that people of such high education and knowledge of the scriptures can be so blind and so wrong. You know, during this time, they were not actively stoning people for adultery. They, they had the law, but they, they had twisted it all up into a whole other thing. Just used it when it was convenient for them and when it helped them. They wasn't doing this stuff. But then they brought this woman in. And, it's, and they, they were not actively enforcing the law of Moses in this matter. And for the very reason that Jesus... And that's the very reason... And for the very reason that Jesus used to disperse them. The reason they weren't enforcing the law of Moses is because they were all immoral themselves. Yes, that's right. They were. You better believe it. I believe that. People who act like this, think like this, treat people like this, they're immoral. Yes. Yes. In any case, anyone who has even a little Bible knowledge would know that there was forgiveness for all sin in the Old Testament. And that being put to death was not the only option. That's right. King David. There you go right there. Thou shalt not surely die. Why? The law says. Because David repented. Read Psalm 51. Yep. David repented of his sin. Truly did. And God cleansed him from his sin. In the Old Testament. <laughs> See, people think once a sinner, always a sinner. Once an adulterer, always an adulterer or an adulteress. Once you've done it, condemned. That means the end. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Throw away. Yeah. You're done. Worthless. 
Goodbye. Put it away. You're put away. You're done for. No, you, you're not even usable anymore. Neither do I condemn thee. Bless the Lord. It seems to be the greatest problem for people to balance the love and mercy of God against the guilt and shame of sin. There are two extremes and everyone seems to run to one or the other. Either condemn them to death or act as if the sin doesn't matter. Jesus did neither here. This is the carnal nature of people, and it always has been. It's always been that way, and it always will be the case unless and, and until the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. You'll have trouble figuring this thing out. But the Bible says that it's, this is wrong. Well, yeah, it's wrong. Well, what do you, but what's your solution? Kill them? Send them on to hell? I've heard preachers say that kind of thing, have that kind of attitude. I've known a lot of people in my life that have that attitude toward sinners. I ain't anybody in the church that would sin. They're done. I ain't no, I mean, throw them out. Is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible teaches? Huh. That's the carnal nature of people. And only, only a person who's truly born again and led by the Holy Ghost of God will have the right attitude towards sin and sinners. We've been reading some books by a preacher that lived in the 1800s. He was not, he didn't succeed as a pastor because yeah, he went because of this reason right here. I found it last night when I read about him. He said, uh, they said about him that he preached that God came to save sinners from their sin. Not that God came to pay, the, to save them from the penalty of sin. Mm -hmm. That's it right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's what I've found in all of my years of studying and praying and figuring this thing out. And God has made it clear to me. That is the issue right there. Right. Saved from the penalty, or are you saved from your sin? And if you're saved from your sin, you get what he got. He got he, his first church, they didn't like it, so they cut his pay and starved him out until he had to quit. So he wrote books instead. Since nobody liked the message of God, and I found out that people who believe God came to save sinners from their sin. There's a depth to their understanding of spiritual matters and of God that goes so far beyond this kind of people here, that it's un, not even comparable. Amen. Yes. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. I could park right there and preach a whole sermon right there. Because that's what everybody believes now. God saved us from the penalty of our sin. Right. But you're just the same old thing. He didn't do nothing about your sinful nature or anything. And so you, and then these same kind of people, isn't it amazing that the people who believe that want nothing but to draw blood when somebody sins? Right. Yes, sir. These sorry guys dragged this woman in the middle. They picked her out to kill, to use, to make an example out of, if you will. And all to, and they didn't care nothing about her. They were just using her. They didn't even care about her adultery. They just, all they were after was the Lord. They wanted Him to agree with them in their views. Right. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> now, let me just say this for a minute here. Let's just park here. The woman, she was caught in adultery in the very act. I believe... It is the most heinous of sins. I believe it's worse than murder. I do. They didn't bring a murderer to Jesus, but an adulteress. adulteress adultery causes much more collateral and lasting damage than murder. Yes, sir. It does. It's easier to deal with if somebody's murdered for their family and everything than, it, than this is. This is a lifelong. Why? I mean, it, it's like an atomic bomb and its consequences in families. 
and churches and everything else. It's terrible. The worst of sin. It's a different kind of offense. And it causes pain on a different level for those affected by it than murder does. An adulteress is perceived as much more heinous than an adulterer. Now, take it or leave it, believe it or not, welcome to the world, that's the way it is. If you can't understand that, let me just say another thing or two about it. Even though the guilt, the penalty, and the consequences are all the same, whether it's a man or a woman, if it's a woman, it's perceived by everyone as much worse. It's just much worse. Say, how can that be? Well, because people think of women better than what they really are. People think of women, I'm talking about fathers and husbands and everybody, just because of women and how they're made, their beauty, their delicateness, all of that, this, this ugliness and this defilement is just... You don't expect it. You know, you do, but not really. Not really. Y'all, y'all, how many of you get that, I wonder? He didn't drag a man. They didn't drag a man caught in adultery in here. They drug a woman in. And she didn't do it by herself. So where is the man? Well, that's that doesn't matter because they're not law keepers anyway. That's not what this is about, keeping the law. It's about setting up the Lord to make Him look foolish, which is the same thing that happens all the time now in every situation, in all the churches and everything. This is the way it's done. You have to make the... the, the well, the preacher's usually the one that catches it because he's the one that's brought up, well, now, they've done this. Now, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What do you want to do? Stone them? Same spirit, same attitude. Same everything as these scribes and Pharisees right here. What do you do? Well, Jesus didn't panic. He didn't get excited. He didn't think the whole thing was going to collapse because of this woman caught in adultery. The contrast is striking here between all of those who were present. <laughs> Did you ever think about this? You got a bunch of onlookers just watching this whole thing. Their service was interrupted by these scribes and Pharisees who came dragging this woman into the middle of the service. Jesus was teaching the people. So you got the scribes and the Pharisees. We have First, let me say this. We have the sinner, a woman caught in the very act. And we have the religious enforcers who are bent on seeing the woman killed. We have the Redeemer of man who they have appointed as the judge. Isn't that something? That they would appoint him the judge. Well, I'm glad they weren't the judge. Yeah. He's always the judge. Get that. It ain't man who decides. It's God. And then we have the Redeemer of man. All these this is what we got here. The sinner, the religious crowd, and the redeemer of man, who they've all appointed to be the judge. And we have the transgressor of the law, the human representatives of the law, and then we have the very lawgiver himself. It's going to be interesting what happens here. Will he agree with them? I mean, they're sticking to the letter. They're sticking to the letter. That's what they're pressing for. The letter of the law. The letter killeth. Yes. The spirit giveth life. Mm -hmm. The letter killeth. That's what it's talking about. A situation just like this. Now the law says, thou shalt not, and she did it. So ain't no other answer. Ain't no other course to take. We got a stoner. But what do you say? You going to let her go? Or do we stone her? Like the law says, Mr. Christ, Mr. Healer, what do you say? Got all the crowds following you? Everybody listening to you? What do you say now? 
but what do you say? The law says, but what do you say? Trying to set the lawgiver against the law. Yeah. Same with the Sabbath and every other issue. That's what the whole thing was between this bunch and the Lord. Yeah. It's the only way they could deal with him. Jesus never broke the law. He never transgressed the law. Yeah. The law stood. Even in this case right here. He said, all right, get your rocks. Pick you up a rock, we'll stone her. But let's just put this out there first. Whoever, whichever one of you is without sin, let him be the first to cast the stone. Well, boy, that just threw a kink in the whole deal. It was supposed to go smoother than this. Yeah. Would they have believed in him if he had said this stoner then? Yeah. And they stoned her. And she's dead. Would that have satisfied them? No, sir. They're never satisfied. It doesn't matter how much blood is drawn. You see the same spirit in the Muslims and in other religions that are just like that. That's why we're preaching on the life of Christ. That's why this is out of the Gospels. The Gospel of John. We're looking at the Lord Himself, how He really is. We're looking at the law. In the light of the lawgiver and how it's supposed to work and be applied. Man, I hope y'all can see some of this. The Pharisees and the scribes are seeking to condemn the lawgiver by persuading him to contradict himself in forgiving the woman. They see the law and forgiveness as a contradiction. They see it as opposing poles. It can't work. It can't be both ways. You break the law, you die. There is no forgiveness. There is no compassion. There is no mercy. But Jesus Christ came full of grace and mercy. Yes. Full of truth and grace. <laughs> All of it. He didn't break the law. He didn't set aside the law. His fulfilling the law does not mean that he set aside the law of God. The moral law of God. We were reading in Deuteronomy this morning and I noticed and I told her, I said, look at how it's all mixed up here. About, here's some ceremonial law about the Passover and all that. And in the same chapter, in amongst, amongst the verses, there's moral law. You can't just say, well, now Deuteronomy from chapter 3 to 5, that's the ceremonial law, we'll cut that out. You can't do that. You've got to have enough spiritual sense and understanding to recognize the difference between ceremonial law, the law that had the, the shadows and types of Christ that foretold of His Christ that showed the atonement and all, and moral law <clears throat> that deals with our interactions with one another, transgressing against one another and hurting one another. Jesus didn't do away with none of that. The moral law is only fulfilled when you obey it and live by it. Now, <clears throat> this shows that they were familiar in some degree with the heart of Jesus. <laughs> well, after all, who's he got in his company? Who's following him around? Just those 12 disciples? No, no, there's, uh, <laughs> there's some women. And one of them is Mary Magdalene. Yes out of whom was cast seven devils. What kind of woman you reckon she was? When a woman is wicked and evil, what kind of woman is she? Well, adultery, one-time adultery. Oh, it's, she did way more than that. And she is in their company. That's why they're setting him up here, see. <laughs> they don't think he'll... They know what he's going to do because they've watched him already. They've watched him heal. Just like the woman you read about there in Mark chapter 5 this morning. You know, he said, Daughter, <laughs> thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Be whole of thine plague. Go in peace. I've got nothing. I'm holding nothing against you. You're forgiven. She told him all. All the truth. She, it doesn't say she told him the truth. She told him all the truth. She spilled her guts. There was a secret there. 
that had never been revealed and she had never got healed. Did you ever think about stuff like that? How deep do you think about things, you know? Why would a woman have an issue of blood for 12 years? Well, let me just throw this out to you. How did they do abortions back then? Yeah. That's right. Huh? She told him all the truth. Let me tell you, you come clean with God. And there's forgiveness. No. Okay, silence. Can you all hear me now? I think that's what this woman did when she said, Lord. So, they were sure that he would not have her stoned because of the mercy they'd already seen him show to other sinners. And the scribes and the Pharisees were strangers to mercy and love. (laughs) They have brought this humiliated woman with her shame into the public square without any mercy or concern for her soul at all. See, that's the gospel we preach. God is not that way. God don't look at a sinner and say, throw them in hell. That's it. You got so many chances, and that's it. You've blown it. I'm done with you. They didn't even see her, really. She was just a thing. She was the means to get to him, to do something to him. She was just the a tool they were using to try to get to Jesus, to destroy him, to cause him problems, and to get rid of him because he was causing them problems. They're cold-hearted. As, you know... This is the way with all carnally minded people who only see things in black and white until it, when it comes to the sin, to sin and the law. Do you understand me? Talk about black and white. I remember when, boy, that's what was preached. It's either black or white. There ain't no gray areas. Now, well, now, there ain't no gray areas, but there is color. There's a, there's a better way to see things than black and white. (laughs) And it comes with wisdom and age and God. Showing you. And it's a thing that happens in life. I've been reading this old man. I'm thankful there's a few old people that are writing stuff on social media, among all the other junk. I've been reading this old man down in Louisiana, a cage, and you've been reading any of his? Oh my goodness. It's rich and spiritual things he's getting he's he started out talking about his grandpa and his dad and his mom and his life and, but it's got way more spiritual and just the he just talks about how that when you're in your 50s you got it but you don't get the oomph until you're in your 60s and 70s you see it but you don't have that oomph I understand what he's talking about. God teaches you these things as you grow. These people are cold-hearted and unforgiving and nothing will satisfy them but the annihilation of the sinner. Until we can just put them all on an island somewhere and drop an A-bomb on them. That'll fix the problem. Well, what a world we could have if we could just just kill them all and get rid of them. Was well, that what Islam thinks? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I believe that's what they think. Mm-hmm. How many Christians that are called Christians think the same way? Basically, really. When you back off where you can get a good view of it, it looks the same. Because it is the same. These are the same Pharisees and scribes that in John 9 claim all are sinners from birth. Remember that blind man? 
Thou wast altogether born in sin, and you're telling us, you're teaching us. And they cast him out. Same guys, which that includes themselves. But they have picked out this woman to kill because she has sinned. It's like a bunch of dogs. A woman, the woman has nothing to say. What do we hear out of her? Nothing. She has been found out. She is sitting there in her shame. She's been uncovered in front of everybody. Brought out into the public square. Think about that. She has nothing to say. Her sin has been brought out into the public and made known to all. She's guilty. And her fate is in the hands of these men around her right now. <laughs> Reckon she's wondering what they're going to do. Reckon she's wondering what Jesus is going to do. What is he going to say? What's she thinking while they're saying, This woman was caught in the very act. Now Moses and the law said that she should be stoned. What do you reckon is going through her mind? I don't fear. Shame. Maybe just hurry up and get it over with. I can't live like this. Yep. What kind of a life am I going to have after this? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Faith and hope. Hope is just around the corner for her, but she don't even know it yet. So, what would have happened if the Lord hadn't been there? Well, it happens in churches all the time because the Lord's not there. Yes. If the Lord is there, there'll be outcomes like this. Yes. Yes. What if that day and every other time that sinners decided to judge other sinners, Jesus was never present? This whole thing about judge not, it's twisted and perverted in this modern day by people who've taken even this scripture here and twisted it to their liking, see, which is as wrong, every bit as wrong as these Pharisees and scribes. There was sin, terrible sin, the worst of sin committed here. Can it just be dealt with so easily and so lightly? Not lightly, not lightly. Jesus didn't deal with it lightly, did he? Truth prevailed there that day. Truth, truth about God and what he's like. I read the other day that when you, somebody said that we're the child of God, is going to be surprised in the when he finds himself in the presence of God for the first time, because we we we're thinking of fear and power and and just being slammed on our face and just scared to death. And, but the what we're going to realize in that moment is the love and compassion and of God toward us. I believe that. Now, to the sinner, it's a different thing. But to the child of God, it's what we, what God made us for. It's what He saved us for. It's what He's prepared us for all of our life. Yes, sir. And when we stand before Him, we're going to, you know, the kindness, the love, the benevolence of God is going to be what overwhelms us. We know He's good. I'm preaching to you this morning that He's good, that He's compassionate, that He's forgiving. That He's l- love. But we just, you know, we're just looking through a glass darkly. And we're only seeing in part. And words from a man here just can't convey the whole truth of it all. The reality of it all. What if He's not there when someone in the church sins? I remember a church up in Pennsylvania and I remember they got all crossways with their pastor and they had a meeting of the men and that's what they, one of them said, one of the guys that was there told me, he said he tried to 
get them to calm down and stop and not be so radical about everything. And they told him to sit down and shut up. We're mowing grass tonight. You know, I mean. Oh, that's a good attitude. Jesus wasn't there. No, sir. No, wasn't. Jesus wasn't there in that place. Or it wouldn't have happened that way. What if he's not there when someone in a Christian family sins? I've known families that have just been blown completely apart and destroyed because of sin of one in the family and they didn't deal with it right. That's right. That's right. Just destroyed everything. Jesus wasn't there. Jesus showed us how to deal with the Pharisees and scribes whose only demand is to draw blood. He showed us how to deal with them. Jesus saw a soul lost and ruined by sin. They didn't see that at all. They just looked at her as a thing. They had no compassion. They didn't look at, us, at her as a soul. You know, and let me just say this again. I'll say it every once in a while just to make sure everybody remembers this. But... You're not a body that, with a soul. You're a soul that has a body. That's right. Yes, sir. You're a soul that has a body. Your body's going to change and get old and wither up and die. But your soul will live forever. Everybody that's in here is going to live forever. One way or another. Jesus abolished death. So when we look at somebody, we can't look at them like they're a bug. Or just a, a, an animal or something. That's right. Their soul. Yes. Made in the image and likeness of God. Yes, sir. And Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's what he saw here. Right. He saw that in, in that woman. He saw... In spite of that horrible sin that woman had committed, he saw in her the very reason he'd come to earth. To be the sacrifice for the sin of all people. And he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Not to destroy all that was ruined. But to rescue. <laughs> and so, so many times. Most of the time. He was the only one. Think about it. When, and, and when they landed on the shore. And the maniac came out of the tombs. He was the only one. When he came down off of the mountain and the demon-possessed child there in Mark chapter 9, he was the only one. The disciples couldn't help. <laughs> Still that way. Sometimes it's, uh, he's the only one that sees. And he's the only one that really cares. Shame on us. We ought to be more like Christ than that. We ought to be like Christ, not like these Pharisees and scribes. They were hypocrites. The truth is the truth. And sin is sin. Neither do I condemn thee, he said. To condemn means to pronounce to be utterly wrong, to utter a sense of disapprobation against, to censure, to blame. Now that's as far as most people take it nowadays, but... It goes right on here and it says, but the word often expresses more than censure or blame and seems to include the idea of utter rejection. Mm -hmm. To doom or to judge or pronounce to be unfit for use or service. So when Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee, he said, I'm not throwing you away. Go and sin no more. Go in peace between you and me. What about all the verses? It says, I will, I will remember thy sin no more. I'll put them as far as the east is from the west. Bury them in the depths of the sea. Then in the New Testament, Jesus said, it says Jesus came to take away our sins. They're not in the depths of the sea or as far as the east is. They're gone! Go in peace. Yep. He just give her a blank check to start all over? Reset? No. no. Go and sin no more. Amen. 
Well, see what an impossible command he gave her. Everybody knows she can't do that. Is that right? See how mixed up everything is. Jesus didn't throw this woman away. He did not pronounce her doomed and utterly rejected because of her sin. It's like we preached a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago, to the uttermost. Where's the line? I mean, where's it at? What, name me the sin that God will not forget. How far can you go? How deep can you go that you're out of God's reach? There is no such thing. He's able to save to the uttermost. And he does. So he said to her, go and sin no more. So to stand against sin, listen to me and I'm going to quit. To stand against sin without having the mind and heart of Christ. You hear me? To stand against sin without having the heart and mind of Christ is to be as condemned as these Pharisees and scribes were as they crept away from the situation they created that day. They didn't go away feeling good. They didn't go away forgiven. They didn't go away right with God. They didn't go away in peace. The adulterous woman did. That's just not how the church sees it, is it? Nope, nope. She's the, she's the transgressor. These are the good guys. No, they're not good guys. They're evil guys. Intellectualism and education and it always, it's always that crowd that does this. Wonder why that's wonder if that ain't why Job said I I know that my maker would soon take me away if I added flat, flattering titles to my name. I am not quoting it exactly right. If I added flattery titles to my name. <clears throat> I know a few I've known a few men who don't want that after their name. And I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I know some men who've earned it and they don't want it after their name. I'm talking about D D E doctor's degrees and all that. <clears throat> and others who didn't even earn it, but man, they wear it proudly. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be associated with that kind of crowd. Jesus, how did he, this man, uh, having not letters, how does he understand all this? I'd rather be there than with the crowd that does this kind of thing. Man, I hope you've understood a little bit of this. This is really a it's a thing. I'm glad it's in my King James Bible. I ain't giving it up. No. Everything that's in here belongs in here. Yes. I don't even have no room in my house for a book that's took verses and passages out. I can't understand people that use other versions and they... And they don't, it doesn't bother them when they come to that blank space where there's no verses. wonder what all these people do that, you know, they, they go to the other versions just for study to compare and get a better understanding. I wonder what they do when they go to that other version and the verse ain't there. It ought to be a red flag to them. And they're bound to find them because there's thousands of words and verses that they've taken completely out. Don't take this away. My goodness. What a what a picture of Christ as he is. Doesn't make me think adultery is a light matter. Doesn't make me think it's easy to get by with. Merciful heavens, if you don't under if you get that idea, you ain't listening to what happened there that day. That's right. But there's forgiveness. With the Lord. Amen. Thank you. And if I didn't believe that fully, I would give up preaching because I don't have nothing to offer because it's a sinful world. <clears throat> and there's people sitting here right now 
that's going to need to know this at some point in your life in the future. There's no telling what lies ahead. And you're going to need to know the simple thing that Jesus loves you and He'll forgive you. If we confess and forsake our sin. He that confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall obtain mercy. Obtain mercy. Mercy. That's God. It's not about the the preacher I spoke of. They said that he believed that it was not about, the atonement was not about satisfying an angry God. I said, hallelujah. I knew it. I knew it. When I read after somebody and they've got the right ideas about things, I know that. I can just almost tell you right now. I know what they believe in those matters. Yes. Uh, and it's a blessing to me when I find it out. Yes, the right. truth will make you free. Yes. Free indeed. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Please bless it to our minds and hearts here this morning. I pray everybody understand correctly here. And I pray that everybody would honor and praise you for your wonderful love and mercy and salvation that you have obtained for us at such a high cost to yourself. Please help us never to forget that. And help us never to forget this when we look at others. When when sin barges into our lives through a loved one or or some other friend or acquaintance or family member. Help us to remember, Lord, that these uh, there's no case that's out of your reach. There's no sin that's beyond your forgiveness, your cleansing, and there's nobody that can't be restored. Please help us to believe these things and to, and to look at other people outside these walls with that knowledge and assurance. <clears throat> I pray our church would be fruitful. I pray we'd make a difference. I pray that we'd see souls in eternity that would have missed it otherwise. Please go with us now. Bless, bless, bless the word to our heart in Jesus' name. Amen.